So a while back I made a video where I tried to beat Borderlands 2 with only the fastball, and that was actually pretty fun. And since my last challenge video's ad revenue barely paid for the resulting therapy sessions, I thought it might be a good idea to have a nice, fun, and wholesome run. So today, we're going to try and answer. Can you beat Borderlands the pre-sequel with only the snowball? Now before you guys ask, yes. I just said I was playing the pre-sequel for fun. I know I dunk on this game a lot, but if I'm being honest, it's my second favorite game of the series, right next to Borderlands 2. The third being Tiny Tina's One-Shot Adventure. You know the standalone game that's just the BL2 Tina DLC? Yeah, that one. Anyway, jokes aside, let me tell you the rules. We'll be trying to be Ultimate Vault Hunter mode at level 70 with no bar and no guns allowed. We are going to be playing as Jack the Doppelganger, and his action skill is kinda allowed, but I'll go over that more in a bit. And most importantly, the snowball is the only grenade we're allowed to use. As for the other gear, we have a pretty normal shield, a level 1 Oz kit so that we can abuse slams, and the best main class mod for grenade damage, and 5 extra points in just compensation. Which makes grenade damage higher for every grenade ammo I'm missing. Here's a quick peek at the build. I feel like I had a lot of extra skill points, so if anything seems out of whack here, it's probably because it is. I'll explain the important skills as we go, so let's get into the run. We arrive at Helios and immediately start doing what you would expect. Beaming these doll guys with nice, wholesome, totally not packed with ice and gunpowder, snowballs. Also as one would expect, we ran out of ammo pretty fast. Compared to Axton and the fastball, we seem to be at a major disadvantage. We only get half the ammo, and we can't throw snowballs while in the fight for your life. But I'm here to say, both those problems are only half wrong. Thanks to the skill Jack's Cash, we get a free grenade for every 4 kills we get. And since we're spec into leadership as well, every time a Digi Jack dies, it counts as a kill. So if we activate our action skill and immediately cancel it, we can farm ourselves up a free grenade. Mind you, I cannot get actual ammo like this, I just get a free throw when I have 4 stacks built up. Another thing we can do after using our action skill is activate On My Mark, which makes the Digi Jacks throw a copy of my grenade mod at the bad guys. And let me tell you, these guys were surprisingly good at hitting their throws. Like sometimes they would just whiff, but other times they were super coordinated, and would just destroy extra enemies I didn't even target. Anyway, lacking ammo isn't an issue anymore, but now what if I go into Fight for Your Life? Well thanks to Potential, I'm allowed to spawn my Digijacks while in Fight for Your Life, and I can also mark a target for them to throw a snowball at and get up that way, or hope that one of my Jacks dies, because leadership can also get me second wins. And the most important skill of the build, Inspire, which makes Jack occasionally inspire us with words of greatness. Everybody, you're looking super handsome. Let's go. Honorable mention to promote the ranks, which would have made super digi jacks that might have boosted grenade damage, but they're kind of bugged out and don't throw grenades properly. Yeah, Gearbox kind of dropped the ball on this one. Since the Digi Jacks kind of have a mind of their own, they will occasionally shoot the bad guys with their wrist lasers. This didn't really have any effect on the gameplay because they're usually only out for a few seconds. So if anyone's salty because I used the Digi Jacks during this run, first off, stop being anti-fun. And second, the run would be impossible without them since I kinda need the ammo. Anyway, after dealing with these guys, we had to fight one of the several pyromaniacs in the Borderlands series, this one being named Flame Knuckle. Now if this was Pokemon, we would be pretty screwed right now. If this was Borderlands 3, he would be pretty screwed right now. But this is TPS, so the fight was pretty fair. Jack was super helpful with distracting him, so I was even able to fend off any extra troops that were flying in. Also during the fight, I used a little bit of RNG manipulation to get more ammo drops from the containers. So if you're below I believe one third of your maximum ammo with any type, you are more likely to get that ammo type from ammo crates. So if we had 3 or less ammo, we could open up the crates and get more ammo than usual. Constantly having a low supply grenades is kinda good since we're specced into that just compensation skill, so we're getting the best value for our trucks. After we busted Flame Knuckles power suit, Jack, Jack, and Jack helped me finish him off. Right after that, we got Moonshot down to the moon and met Janie Springs. We needed to help her take out Deadlift. Deadlift tried to take her out, on a date that is, and when she said she wasn't into guys, he got all mad and stole her Moonzumi key, which we need to get to Concordia. If the Borderlands 2 players are confused, Concordia is just Sanctuary, but on the moon. Anyway, with a little bit of inspiration from... Zarpedon, I guess, we set off on our journey to beat Deadlift in a snowball fight. But first, we had to take care of a bunch of his lackeys. My favorite part about using this grenade mod is that every time you kill a scav, 
Uh oh, looks like the Borderlands 2 players are confused again. Okay, scavs are just bandits, but on the moon. Anyway, every time you kill a scav with a snowball, they get launched and literally break orbit. For real, they don't come back down. The scavs were getting so messed up by my snowballs that they eventually decided to chill out. We can finally fight deadlift, and there's a lot more in the line than you think. This run was still on its first life, and when I'm on my first life, my focus and skill are tenfold, because I make diamonds under pressure. Just, uh, don't quote me on that if you watch the last run, okay? Deadlift is like the Captain Flint of the pre-sequel. He's got enough annoying and unfair mechanics to absolutely torture you during your first playthrough. I'm talking electrifying the floor, homing blue balls, stop laughing that's not funny, evasive maneuvers, and a lot of minions to keep you on edge. Lucky for us, I know this guy's patterns pretty well and went straight for the safety stairs. Right here you have access to cover, you have an escape route, and the stairs don't get electrified. Patience was key to winning this fight. Well, that and a little Matrix style dodging in order to get all the ammo crates in the arena. After some close calls, we finally broke his shield and the rest was history. Still a one life baby, Woo! Anyway, we got the Moon Zoomy station working and carefully jumped the scap. There are three jumps in this game that are very wonky and will punish you with death if you mess them up. The next one being on the way to Concordia. My first death being a cliff would be super cringe, so I made sure to hit this carefully. Right as we get into town, the cop claptrap was trying to give us a ticket, and I didn't appreciate that too much. Anyway, we got shafted by the Marif, that's an elevator joke, and Roland was busy dealing with the secondhand embarrassment of Lilith doing the hokey pokey on the dance floor, so there was only one thing left that could solve our loneliness. Looking for me, sugar? What? No, not Moxie. I'm talking about a monster inhale style and some inspiring words from Crazy Earl himself. After we hijacked some cellular towers and found the location of the jamming signal, we were off to Crisis Scar to shut it down so we could get Jack off of Helios. I was going to pick a cool icy looking skin for our car, but noticed that this one was literally my outro catchphrase, so I couldn't pass it up. Scavtrap said I had to show my worthiness of joining Red Belly's gang in order to get in, but I had a different idea. Second option. Let me in. So the Darksiders were our next target. One of the main bosses here ended up dropping a Jackal cannon, not sure if it was because we were playing as Jack or the fact that it was October at the time, but I'm willing to bet it was both. Anyway, after killing all the edgy guys, we finally were allowed into Crisis Scar. We were blowing right through Red Belly's defenses. That was until this super bad mugger showed up. To my knowledge, the scaling in Ultimate Vault Hunter mode is a lot different in this game than in Borderlands 2. I'm pretty sure every enemy gets their health boosted, but big guys get a bigger boost. So this info's from the wiki, so definitely take it with a grain of salt. But according to them, normal enemies get a 1.5 times health and shield boost from True Vault Hunter mode to Ultimate Vault Hunter mode, and big guys get a 2.5 times boost to their health and a 3.5 times boost to their shields. So these guys are pretty tanky. I had to make sure I played smart and farm my grenades safely. After killing mugger number one, I had to also kill mugger number two. Luckily, my mans fell right into my trap and I was able to get an early chunk of his health out of the way before I let the boys put the ice on him. We also ended up bullying the local grade schoolers and that was pretty fun. And after that, we were off to fight Red Belly. The game made this pretty easy for me. Why farm up nades with Digijacks when I could just walk over to this vendor and trade all the loot I found for some more? We had a couple close calls early on, but Red and Belly split up, which allowed me to gang up on them one on one. Belly was a scary powerhouse who dropped us a striker, and Red was just kind of AFK for the most part. After we dealt with them, we shut down the jabbing signal, got skimmed out of our moonstones by this chest, and found out the Marif was working for the bad guys. We started interrogating him, and he said Dahl was making him do it. So I was like, don't worry man, just be cool. Anyway, we were gonna let the Marif live, but he tried to kill Jack and started Jack's lifelong murderous trust issues. Now that Jack was rescued, we needed to start building an army to take Helios back. I tried using the snowball to put the door code in and was a little spooked when it didn't work, but I was able to just use the interact button to punch in the door code, so the run doesn't end here. Janie Springs helped us get a new vehicle, this one can fly, kinda, so I wasn't about to trust it with my life. A cool trick you could do with the stingray is to boost up a little bit, press the slam key, and then boost again as you bounce to get more height for your jump. I was a bit rusty so I took a couple of minutes to make sure I got this because holy crap how am I still alive? I don't know if the snowball is just that good or the pre-sequel is just too easy or if Jack is too OP or what. Actually you know what I think it's just definitely Jack being too OP. Anyway after meeting Pickle we set off to get our military AI from the bosun. I had to do a bunch of annoying things to get to a ship but for the most part I was ballin. And by ballin I mean ballin my friggin eyes out cause I finally died. Back. 
Beam him. No! No! For some reason, the guy that killed me shrunk after I respawned and it was easier to kill, so that's pretty neat. After a few close calls and dying again because I went down right as I hit a jump pad, we managed to get the methane flowing again so that we could get across this lava lake. Waiting for us on the other side were a bunch of cheaters and I didn't like that too much, but I wasn't exactly playing fair either. The first thing we needed to do was destroy the bosun's engine, which was a bit tricky. The snowballs would go right through the thing we needed to hit, so I had to bounce the snowballs off other surfaces and have them explode close enough to the power stabilizers to deal damage. I just thought that was pretty weird. Oh, also, turns out the one mugger I thought shrunk didn't shrink at all, cause I found him here. Homie was screaming at me a lot, something about how could I do that to his son or something, not really sure what that was all about, but he seemed pretty mad. He got his revenge, and he was even fighting honorably using a snowball himself, and I barely had enough energy left to fight poop deck after. Wrong with you, my love? Anyway, the Boston fight was up next and I had a game plan. First off, we had to take out his shield regen turrets because there was no way I was going to be able to farm grenades fast enough to out damage them. And step two was to just let him have it. Me and the lads made an absolute hailstorm for him. Shields resist cryo damage, so that slowed us down a bit. But once he lost his shield, I found a plethora of grenades and the lads and I finished him off. Now that we had a military grade AI, we just needed an army to go with it. As we were fighting our way through the torque infested robot factory, we came across Gladstone, aka the inventor of the toaster, aka the inventor of the blue toaster, aka the man that sent me to the gulag too many times! Okay, sorry about that pent up rage. Anyway, he's going to help us create the constructor bot, which is good for us right now, but absolutely tragic for my Borderlands 2 runs. Once inside, I found a very obnoxious mugger who kept lighting me on fire. I guess it was super effective after all because man's killed me four times before I beat him. Pretty sure these guys are to blame for most of my deaths this run and this guy alone was responsible for half of them. Because of his fire weapon, not being in a vacuum sucked. Well, being in a vacuum would suck, but in a more literal sense I guess. Anyway, after I realized getting lit on fire hurts and kills me, I played it safer and finally killed him. After we performed the first ever cryogenic castration, we were finally able to get the power on and start making our constructor bot. Step one was to create the eye of the constructor. By combining a bunch of other eyeballs from these guys who can't see where they're going, that might be counterintuitive. Step two was to secure the main body. Step three was to calibrate the turrets. To do so, they need to kill 12 bad guys themselves and their damage is kinda... bad. So this part took way too friggin long. It seems no matter what game I play, turrets always seem to slow me down. Why did they spawn bad? Step four was to get the legs. Felicity was going to pilot the robot we were going to steal them from. Her health bar was dropping and I was kinda curious to see what happens if she lost all her health, but she kinda killed everything too fast for me to find out. And just like that, the constructor was made. And this time, it was on our side. Oh come on, I gotta fight a constructor in this game too? Okay, so this fight can get bad quickly if we don't manage our resources properly. Felicity often spawns two surveyors to aid her in battle. One that repairs her, and one that makes her invulnerable to damage. The protective bubble can be annoying, but the repair surveyor is where the issue starts to come up. If we can't gain our ammo back fast enough to keep up with the spawning of drones and repairs, we won't be able to take her down. A little bit of multitasking was needed to win this fight. I wanted to make sure my ammo was low as possible, so that just compensation would make my throws as strong as they could be. And also, so that ammo containers would give me more ammo altogether. I was doing this while also farming up ammo with my digijacks and having them throw their snowballs. Did I just describe the strategy I've been using for the whole run but more dramatic? Yeah, pretty much. For real though, I needed to first try the boss, otherwise I would have to reset the map to fill all my ammo containers again. Luckily, I don't think Felicity has the 95% grenade damage reduction like constructors do in Borderlands 2, so that's good at least. I was running out of ammo crates, but luckily I managed to get her into her final phase right as that happened, so I didn't have to worry about any more surveyors. So my objective was to just survive. I just needed to farm up snowballs and make sure that these guys didn't pick up any guns. After a long fight, we finally got Felicity to short circuit and rejoin our side. As a reward, Jack gave me another... Jacko cannon? Uh, I guess that's a moment of all time. Now that we had our army, it was time to retake Helios. The first place we wanted to retake is Jack's office, and we needed the help of Claptrap to get in. 
I was in my element here. Quite literally, since Claptrap somehow made a snowstorm on a space station. Hey doll guys, freeze! Fighting the trained military soldiers felt a lot easier than fighting the dumb scavs for some reason. So getting to Jack's office was a breeze. Our next goal was to save Gladstone again along with his other buddies. Nothing too interesting here, just waiting for the scientists to open doors, oh my god! Anyway, after I saved them all I took a quick pee break and everyone played Among Us without me. Pretty sure all the scientists got ejected and so did I because next thing I knew I was flying through the veins of Helios making sure I didn't fall into the endless depths of space. Sarpedon almost got me with her mischievous tomfoolery. After blowing some stuff up though, we managed to get out of that nightmare fuel area. The last spot before our fight with Sarpedon was the lunar launching station. Here we needed to disable a force field in order to pass. I defused all the power cells without blowing them up because I'm very good at this game and I would never make a mistake like that. After that, all I had to do was survive a few waves of some extremely casual bad guys. Lucky for me, I was able to activate some gun loaders to distract them. At this point, I was ready to fight a tough boss, and I didn't have the patience to wait for the shock field to go down, or the patience to wait for Jack to hop on the elevator. Zarpadon was going down. If she was going to set traps for me, I was going to set traps for her. I had two things going for me during this fight. Number one was Jack distracting Zarpadon, and two was that ammo crates would continuously spawn during the fight. I also had two things going against me during this fight. First off, cryo damage on Zarpadon's big shield was doing very little damage, and two, she can get her shield back pretty much instantly. On the bright side, this is the pre-sequel run where I finally figured out how her shield recharge move works. If you pay attention here, you can see that Zarpadon is draining the power cores from the floor, and when she is done, it breaks and she can't use that same power core again, which means she will eventually run out of recharges. During this fight, she used all six of her charges before committing to trying to kill Jack. To be specific, the real Jack, not the fake one or the fake fake ones. Without her shield, it was only a matter of time before I found enough grenades to take her down. It was now time for phase two of the fight. 0.8 seconds into this part of the fight, I get distracted by an orange loot beam and snag the ZX one drop from her power suit. I know all 12 pre-sequel players are mad right now that I got the designated drop from the one-time kill. After that, I started trying to fight Zarpadon, but geez man, she knows how to dodge. I feel like my accuracy went from good to bad so freaking quick. I feel like she was standing still trying to fight Jack and I was still missing. This phase also introduces a bunch of ascended doll soldiers and at this point it was too chaotic to keep track of anything at all. All I could do was run around like a chicken with my head cut off and hope to find some grenades so that I could miss Zarpadon some more. I think Jack was the MVP for this fight honestly, uh, still talking about the real one. Pretty sure he did more damage than me, but on the bright side, I can make all the pre-sequel players even angrier with this prismatic bulwark, another designated drop off a one-time kill. By the way, the save file with all the cool gear I found throughout the run will be in the description down below if you want it. Now that the bad guy was beaten and we had the Eye of Helios slash Destroyer and its inspiration bestowed upon us, we could finally go to the vault. Feel like I'm missing something important? Uh, eh, probably not. Anyway, Rago Solitude was very short. The game played this cutscene for the Guardians, but also gave me the option to just run right past them. I don't know why they gave him a cutscene if it's not a required fight. Also not a required fight was this guy who surrendered. Snowball fighting etiquette is to spare anyone who surrenders, so I let him go. Unless... RK5 aka Rom Comp Jet Mark 5 aka Bootleg Bunker was our next boss to take down, and our most challenging one yet. Not only was ammo scarce, but hitting RK5 was really tough since it's usually way out of our range. My Digijax also had a lot of trouble landing shots on it, so I tried to use them to kill off the waves of... Churros? Also had to deal with a few more cheaters during this fight. Huh? 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 Much like Felicity, if I were to die during this fight, I would have to save quit to reset all the ammo crates, or I'd just be making the fight a lot harder than it needed to be. My best bet with this fight was to fight Flyer with Flyer. There are two jump pads on this map that gave me a great deal of mobility. On top of getting me out of sticky situations, they also helped me farm up grenades because Digijacks die if they're too far away from you. Our game plan was to conserve our ammo best we could and only throw snowballs if we were sure we could land the shots. There's one attack where RK5 gets really low to the ground, and I was able to land most of my shots when he did this maneuver. This boss fight ended up killing me four times before I managed to get a winning fight, and that winning fight required me to dodge bad guys and bomb strikes for 30 minutes. As a reward, the game gave me a Boomacorn, 
was a little scared I was going to get another Jacko Cannon, but that would never happen. Now that RK5 was out of the way, I was allowed to do the pre-sequels version of the whole percent speedrun. After that, we finally made it to the vault and we were ready to reap our reward. Oh, come on, dude. Anyway, after some inspiration from Tina, yeah, I'm not sure how that one worked either, and fighting off whatever the heck this thing is, it was finally time to fight the Sentinel. Just kidding, I went to Moxie's bar and got one of those drinks for 30 minutes of damage reduction because I knew this fight was going to take a while. The Sentinel is a seven phase fight, but it has always been fair. This time around, I was really able to take advantage of his bullet deflecting move by simply not using bullets. However, the third phase was an ice phase, so my damage really dropped off and it took a while, but the game plan was pretty much the same. The big sentinel was a bit more tricky to deal with. Instead of just running around in circles, I had to play an elaborate game of the floor is lava. I also had to make sure I was nailing this guy in the head because my grenades weren't doing damage otherwise. We had a lot of close calls during this fight, and towards the end, we were running low on damage reduction. This is also where the Sentinel started doing some really cursed strats. I don't know exactly what was happening. All I knew is that I was taking knockback constantly. I think he knew the end was near, so he was trying to get me as far away from him as possible. It wasn't gonna work though. In the end, he set himself up for the perfect trick shot, which means you can beat Borderlands, the pre-sequel, with only the snowball. Before we go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching up to this point. I know this wasn't the hardest run in the world, but I had a lot of fun this time around. If you want to support the channel, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and all that good stuff. I do read all my comments and love hearing your guys' kind words and ideas for future runs. If you want to support me more directly, consider becoming a channel member. 99 cents gets you videos a day early, and the support also helps me get videos out faster for everyone. I'll have links to my Discord, Twitter, and Twitch channel where I stream these runs in the description. But until next time, breathe easy, homies.